Hello, I'm Monse Alvarado, and this is EWTN News In-Depth. The U.S. Border Patrol struggles as the number of migrants swell at our southern border. What can be done to meet this humanitarian need? We're joined by leading Catholic experts on refugees and migration. We need to welcome the immigrants in a, in, in, in a way that is, is good for the immigrants and is good for us in this country. So that's why we need uh, immigration reform. The president of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops goes on the record. We talked to Archbishop Jose Gomez about immigration, the importance of protecting our borders, and the Biden administration. As the pandemic continues to take an economic swipe at women and families, more voices are calling for paid family leave. We'll examine what some call an emergency of care. So I have courage. Have courage because you have God on your side. And with him, we can do anything. We remember the foundress of EWTN, Mother Angelica, on this fifth anniversary of her passing. Mother Angelica's legacy launched mission work on universities around the U.S. We talked to campus missionaries focused on her example. EWTN News In Depth is next. Welcome to EWTN News In Depth. Topping our program today, the surge of immigrants at our southern border. Of special concern, the number of unaccompanied minors making their way to the U.S. and our government's attempts to care for them. There are no easy answers to deal with a long-standing and complicated issue. Reporter Mark Irons explains. As more and more migrant families and children reach the U.S. southern border, many will meet Sister Norma Pimentel. She's the executive director of Catholic Charities Rio Grande Valley. Sister Norma has been helping migrants for years. As far as comparing it to other times, we've seen this before. We saw it in 2014, in 2019. 19 was way up. Truly a crisis, you know, right now I don't know that we are in a crisis. But the word crisis has been used by some to describe the amount of border backlog and the burden on officials. The Biden administration has tried to avoid the word. On Thursday, in his first official press conference, President Joe Biden had to address the border situation head on. So what we're doing now is attempting to rebuild, rebuild the system that can accommodate the, the, what is happening today. The vast majority, the overwhelming majority of people coming to the border and crossing are being sent back. The Department of Homeland Security is addressing the situation as border officials say they've seen a dramatic spike in the number of people they're encountering at the southern border. The secretary of DHS with a message for migrants earlier this week. We are uh, elevating our messaging uh, so that the uh, individuals do know that they cannot come to the border. The border is closed. That announcement follows increased numbers at the border since President Biden's inauguration. Unaccompanied minors are among those being detained in border facilities. Sister Norma gives one explanation. Something that has changed was the fact that Mexico is no longer allowing for any child under the age of six to be allowed to send back to Mexico. So that's what's causing so many families to be released in the United States. According to Biden administration officials, the U.S. Border Patrol has encountered more than 29,000 unaccompanied minors since October 1st. Nearly the same number of youths taken into custody for all of the previous budget year. These images were obtained by Democratic Congressman Henry Cuellar, who was granted access to detention centers. At a border patrol station is no place for a child, and that is why uh, we are working around the clock to move those children out of the border patrol facilities into the care and custody of the Department of Health and Human Services. Republicans, including Florida Senator Rick Scott, blame President Biden for what's happening and demand he focus on border security. Joe Biden needs to get down here to the border and look at exactly what he's done and do everything he can to secure this border. His actions are putting people at risk. But Democrats, like Speaker Nancy Pelosi, say the increase in migration is typical uh, this you know time today, of year. In the spring, more people do come, so there will be more as there are now. But they have to know, as the president has said, don't come. Meanwhile, the country's Catholic bishops continue to pay attention. Bill Canney, the executive director for Migration and Refugee Services with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, described why he calls the situation on the border a crisis. 
it's a crisis for every single individual and family that has been forced to flee their country, who has been stuck at the border. Canny says the U.S. needs a secure southern border. He also says providing aid to hurting countries will prevent migrants from taking the dangerous journey to the U.S. in the first place. We have seen the administration begin to look at uh, funding in uh, Central America uh, and Mexico that would stabilize and support populations there that would prevent them from actually uh, coming uh, north. Mark Irons, EWTN News in depth. For a unique perspective on the immigration issue, EWTN News in depth turned to one of the most important Catholic voices in America today, the president of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Archbishop Jose Gomez of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles is on the record. Pues te voy a saludar en español porque somos hispanohablantes y somos Bien. mexicanos. Claro que sí. <laughs> This interview is very personal to me, both because we're Mexican, but also because we're naturalized citizens. Right. I know that's a that's a big deal to me. Um, I remember that moment, and I'm sure that you remember that moment for yourself as well. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> how does that influence who we are as Catholics and how we worship? How does our Mexicanness or our hyphenated identity affect us? Um, well, obviously, on, on, the, on the, um, the, the first and most important thing is that we are our children of God, no matter what we were born or what nation are we citizens of. But at the same time, uh, uh, every, every country, every, every part of the world have different traditions and different ways of uh, uh, living our Catholic faith. So I think it is, a, it is a, a for, for immigrants in the United States, it's for us, it's a great blessing to be here because we can be part of this country uh, and uh, integrate in this country and at the same time bring those beautiful traditions uh, to the Catholic Church in the United States. But like you were saying, we're, we're Catholic first. So even though we have hyphenated cultural identities, our Catholicism is at our heart. It's what we bring with us. It's what brings us together. Um, in coming together, there is this sense of the immigrant as the other. We have seen that in, in many places where the immigrant isn't treated as someone who is um, a part of, uh, an equal part of society. Uh, and we're seeing now some proposals to bring the 12 million people who are here as immigrants um, into that kind of full communion, full unity with the rest of the country. How should Catholics think about that and discern that reality? Well, I, the first thing I would say is that we all are immigrants in this country. This is a country of immigrants. So uh, uh, that's the first thing we, we need to keep in mind. And obviously, uh, 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 all the immigrants, we all, all have to have the understanding that we have to integrate in this culture. So there are some, some cultural traditions in the United States that we all need to uh, uh, make part of our lives. And at the same time, I, I think it's important for, for all of us to understand that the teachings of the Catholic Church include that countries have the right to protect their borders. You've been in these places where there are a lot of immigrant communities, San Antonio, Denver. Um, how is that an opportunity for the church? And Los Angeles. And Los Angeles, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's a great blessing. Uh, I think in, I, uh, everywhere that I have been, uh, uh, the, the immigrants are a blessing. You know, the people for coming from Latin America, the people coming from the Philippines, the people coming from Vietnam or Korea, all of those, everywhere, and, and Europe, I mean, it's just an extraordinary blessing. In the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, we have mass in more than 40 languages. So, and the people are so active, and, and they make a huge contribution to the life of, Catholic, of, the, of the, the Catholic Church in Los Angeles, everywhere. So I think it is important to see that, specifically the Latinos, now uh, the numbers of Latinos in this country is, uh, has grown a lot, the more than 50% of Catholics under 18 are Latino heritage. So, and, and, and it's a great opportunity for the church in the United States to get them involved and, and participate actively in the life of the church. I think it's a blessing. You mentioned a mass in 40 languages. I have a, a curiosity about that because of my own experience and I'm sure experiences of a lot of our viewers. Uh, what does that do, having so many languages? Does that maybe create the opportunity for a fractured parish life where people don't really get to know each other? No, not anymore. I mean, in the old times in the United States, we have the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, national churches 
you know, if uh, churches were dedicated to one specific, now we all are together. Uh, so it, it integrates the different communities. And obviously, uh, honestly, everybody speaks English. While the U.S. Catholic population grew in citizenship, it also grew in Catholic leadership. As of last year, six of the nine U.S. Supreme Court justices are Catholic. And this year, President I, Biden was sworn Robinette in as the second Biden Catholic Jr. president in the history of the country. But he has faced criticism for not aligning his political ideologies to the teachings of the church. There is a statement of disappointment over the COVID relief bill, including um, not including restrictions uh, for, for abortion funding um, and getting rid of the Hyde Amendment. And I know that that was a source of great disappointment that was, that was expressed. Are you also disappointed that the administration hasn't gotten rid of the federal death penalty? That you haven't seen any movement on that yet? Yeah, uh, uh, there are many things that they haven't done yet. The immigration is one of them. The death penalty is another one. So I, uh, we are trying to, uh, and, and I think the lay people need to help us to uh, uh, bring to the attention of the administration these issues that are so important. Archbishop Gomez says no matter who is president, the Catholic Church finds a way to work with them for the good of society. So we need to understand that uh, that, that helps the, the people to understand that we Catholics are good people. <laughs> we are not perfect, and, and uh, everybody has different ways of doing things. So I think, uh, uh, I think we need to understand that. Uh, I mean, uh, 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 and it is important to pray for him and pray for his administration. On the other side, every administration, uh, 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 presidential administration, has different ways that we are close to that are important for us and some of the other things that are not, not important for that or not that important for that administration. So it is, it, is, it is part of the political reality of the United States. It happens in every state. It happens in every, in every city. So I think we need, need to understand that, that even if there are those differences, we all need to be together uh, as Catholics, bring it to society, and hopefully to the, uh, uh, this uh, Biden administration, as we try with every single administration before, that the values of the Catholic Church are based on God's plan of hum for humanity, and that's what is going to make all of us happy and, and find that peace and, and uh, uh, and, uh, and joy that is part of uh, God's plan for humanity. The bishops had friction over the best way to engage on differences with the Biden administration, how to avoid controversy over the distribution of communion to Catholics and public service openly at odds with Catholic teaching on abortion and same-sex marriage. But the bishops did show unity on other issues. That can be a great source of confusion, though, for lay Americans who are looking to the bishops for leadership and looking to, to the bishops for guidance on how to discern all of this, is the conference united in its voice and its approach to how they're going to work with um, or correct the Biden administration? So we are united. I mean, we have different ways of doing it because we are different, but at the same time, we are, I think we are united in, in trying to, to bring God's uh, 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 plan uh, uh, to everybody in the United States. You've been involved in your own Supreme Court cases, um, and last year there was a great Supreme Court decision that got rid of Blaine Amendments, these anti-Catholic laws that were limiting Catholic partnership in civil society. What can we, what, what can, what will we see, or what can we expect in leadership from the bishops on this issue of Catholic schools and how Catholic schools can now do more or partner with the government in different ways? Well, first of all, Catholic schools are a great blessing. Uh, we all know that. I mean, I went to Catholic schools uh, growing up, and, and it really made a huge difference in my, in my life. My parents invested in sending me to Catholic schools in Mexico, so that was an extraordinary blessing for me. Now, in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, we have a little more than 70,000 kids in Catholic schools, so it's an extraordinary blessing for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, and, and historically in this country, Catholic schools have been an, an extraordinary blessing. So uh, I, I think now with this situation, the decision of the Supreme Court needs to help us to uh, uh, understand how the government needs to help us, in, because most of our, uh, right now, uh, the, the students in Catholic schools, at least in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, I think like 70% of them are minorities. 
and people in, in, in difficult financial situation. We help them to be able to come to Catholic schools. If we have the help of the government, that's an extraordinary blessing. Is there something that you think is either political or social or cultural that Catholics should be very aware of and that the conference is planning to, to be very active in? If we live in a secular society. We need, and people don't pay attention to us, and they don't even pay attention to Jesus Christ. So we need to continue uh, with, with enthusiasm, bringing the truth of the faith to the people of our time. Exactamente, mucho gusto. Que viva la Virgen de Guadalupe. Y viva Cristo Rey. Que viva Cristo Rey. <laughs> Thank you to Archbishop Gomez for sharing his thoughts on so many topics, including his viewpoint that we are all immigrants at some point. Next, we're joined by a panel expert in the church's implementation of immigration policies. They share their direct knowledge of what's going on right now on both our southern border and around the globe. Mary is a search. What a mother. We all need a mother today who uh, loves us as we are. And we honor our foundress, Mother Angelica, how her legacy lives on. Welcome back to EWTN News In Depth. I'm Monse Alvarado. We continue our discussion on immigration, now with some very powerful voices on this important topic. Joining us is His Eminence Cardinal Michael Turney, the Undersecretary of the Migrants and Refugees Section of the Holy See's Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development. He joins us from Rome. Jennifer Allman, the Executive Director of the Texas Catholic Conference of Bishops. She speaks to us from Austin, Texas. And EWTN's Executive Editor and D.C. Bureau Chief, Dr. Matthew Bunsen. He joins us here in Washington, D.C. Thank you all for taking part in this discussion. Cardinal Cherney, your role in Rome covers the global church. A U.N. migration report notes that the U.S. is the number one destination for migrants, and there were 272 million migrants globally in 2019. Can you speak to the causes of these international migrations? Well, the, uh, the causes are, um, are many, uh, are deep, and are basically very easy uh, for us to understand. Uh, for the majority of people who migrate, they migrate freely uh, because they are attracted. There's the pull factor. They want to study, they want to work, they want to uh, uh, live somewhere else. They want uh, all the reasons that um, many of us have moved. Very few of us actually live where we started off. So the majority are uh, migrants and they uh, move freely. And then the, the sad minority are the people who are forced to flee, and they are pushed. Uh, they are obliged to flee, and they flee for the very same reasons that uh, we would flee if uh, our family was in danger, if we were under grinding poverty, if uh, we were persecuted, uh, if there was war, or if there's uh, the effects, uh, ever more drastic effects of climate crisis. So uh, the uh, majority move freely, uh, you might say, for a better life, and the minority are forced to flee uh, to save their lives, and in a special way, they're motivated uh, to assure that their children can get an education. In your recent article, you, you talked about the communal dimension of evangelization and engagement of all people. How does this biblical call to shelter the migrant fit into this vision? Well, it, it starts with uh, with uh, with whoever happens to be knocking on your door. The the first point is that you open the door. Uh, so uh, our uh, first response to anybody really is uh, to open ourselves, and that's uh, that's the deep message of uh, Fratelli Tutti. And by opening ourselves to the other, we are already beginning to share the good news, which is that we are. Uh, brothers and sisters, and at least implicitly, uh, we are also sharing the fact that we've been saved uh, by Jesus Christ and that we recognize and uh, adore God as our Father and so on. Thank you so much. Jenny, moving past the discussion of whether the U.S. has a crisis or not, you've spoken to Bishops Flores and Seitz who have visited the border and to Texas representatives on the ground. What is causing this spike? Well, the current spike that we're seeing in, at the, for the most part at this particular time is the traditional spring migration. Every spring we see this, this large migration that comes through. 
For a little while, previously in the last month, it was the Remain in Mexico policy being lifted. Families had been encamped in tents on the other side of the border on the Rio Grande Valley for 18 months, families with small children waiting for their turn to come in. And that turn arrived, and so we're seeing 600 a day um, coming in in the Rio Grande Valley. Just like you mentioned, um, and Speaker Pelosi mentioned this as well, and the LA Times, they noted that migration surges happen at the start of each administration when immigrants try to test the borders. So you're saying that's not the case here, or it is? It's a little bit of both, but, but every year there's a spring migration when the weather permits that kind of travel. Um, it's really hot in Texas in, in August. It's really hot in Mexico in August. And so they want to get their migration done and into the United States by June um, because it's a much tougher road. What are the conditions like there on the ground, on the border? Um, you know, it's a pretty orderly arrival system. Um, the migrants come in. They are immediately welcomed by Border Patrol. The, the thing that's different in the Rio Grande Valley is that it's 98 percent Catholic. So the Border Patrol agents are Catholic, and they immediately take them across to Sister Norma Pimentel's shelter run by the Diocese of Brownsville. Those who are uh, test positive for COVID, everyone's tested. The Diocese of Brownsville pays for them to stay in a hotel in order to, you know, ensure that they can quarantine safely before they make their way to find their families. Cardinal Cherney, migrants contribute to entrepreneurial activity and innovation. How have they done this for the Catholic Church? Well, they, they, I mean, they, they don't do it for the church. They do it in the church. As members of the church, uh, they uh, get involved uh, in what, uh, whatever activity they're uh, able to do or interested in or whatever work is available. And um, when it comes to uh, entrepreneurship, they are, uh, uh, on average, more uh, enterprising than, uh, than the locals. In other words, they, they tend to... Uh, invest more to um, do better in the the uh, enterprises which they start. So they are. Um, I think the the interesting thing is that that given a chance, they become uh, active and uh, contributing members of the community and of the parish uh, right from the start. And uh, that g gives a, I would say a boost to the local church and the local economy, which. Um, which unfortunately isn't often uh, is often overlooked or not recognized. Matthew, looking at the U.S., Senator Robert Menendez introduced President Joe Biden's immigration reform proposal, and he's also a part of a new bipartisan working group. How likely is it that a comprehensive bill will emerge? Well, we've had a, a consensus, a bipartisan agreement for many years uh, that uh, serious immigration reform is needed. A uh, number of administrations have proposed them, including the new Biden administration. Uh, there is at least the sign of hope uh, that with this bipartisan group meeting with Bob Menendez, uh, Senator Menendez, as well as Senator Cornyn from Texas, and a number of other Republicans and Democrats, that this is an, at least an opportunity to talk. There is, however, also bipartisan consensus uh, that the passage of a bill that is being proposed by the Biden administration is highly unlikely. I think one avenue that they may embrace, and this is certainly something that the Conference of Catholic Bishops here in the U.S. Uh, is supporting, is a more piecemeal approach. We just saw the House of Representatives passing two uh, pieces of legislation relating to immigration that the U.S. Uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, is in support of. Uh, but uh, the, certainly the fate of those bills in the Senate uh, remains up in the air, especially in light of the humanitarian crisis that has now developed at the border. And Vice President Kamala Harris has been named head of that border initiative as an issue of national security. Is this an unprecedented role for a vice president? No, we're actually seeing history repeat itself with uh, Vice President uh, Harris. Uh, then Vice President Joe Biden was actually given an almost identical role by then President Obama uh, to try to coordinate two things. One, to get the border under control, uh, but then also to initiate and advance a program to assist the countries of Central and Latin America uh, from where most of the migrants are heading uh, our way. Uh, in other words, uh, to try to build their economies and give them greater social and political stability. Uh, I think the general agreement was that in the Obama years, that uh, general initiative was not as successful as uh, certainly had been hoped. Uh, we'll have to see if Vice President Harris has more success. Jenny, you get the last word. From a church teaching perspective and as a Catholic leader in the Texas community, why is this a crit critical issue for Catholics? Why is this a humanitarian and, and heart issue? 
Because at the bottom line, the people coming across the border in Texas right now are mothers and fathers who are fleeing. Um, it's that minority that the Cardinal spoke of. They are fleeing from violence. If you lived in conditions that would allow you or cause you to want to live in an encampment for 18 months at the Rio Grande Valley um, just for a better way of life, things must be pretty bad. And so as Catholics, it's our call to answer the door, to welcome the stranger, and to, to greet these human persons in their brokenness and help them to find the path that we want to see, which is that integral human development. Thank you all for that important conversation. A lot of food for thought. And next, some top headlines for this week in review. I needed to push back and say, no, this is not going to be an answer for our family. And a look at how leave policies in the U.S. are impacting families. EWTN News In Depth will be right back. The tragedy of another mass shooting tops this week in review. Ten people are dead, including the first police officer to respond in a supermarket shooting in Boulder, Colorado. The 21-year-old suspect made his first court appearance on Thursday. He is being held without bail on ten charges of first-degree murder. The shooting spree was the seventh mass killing this year in the U.S. Since the Columbine shooting 22 years ago, Colorado has passed several gun control laws, including universal background checks and a red flag law. But state leaders say their laws were not enough, and they urge federal gun control reform. This was a blow to the entire community. It really, when we see these tragedies happen in different parts of our country, uh, everyone likes to think that wouldn't happen here. People have gathered for vigils outside the King Super's grocery store and across the country. In Washington, President Biden called on the Senate to pass bipartisan gun control laws. The suspect in the mass shooting at the Atlanta area spa less than a week before has been kicked out of his church. Parishioners of the Crabapple First Baptist Church in Milton, Georgia, voted to expel him from their congregation, saying the shooting displayed, quote, the total corruption of mankind. Eight people died in the shooting, six of them Asian women. In a statement, the church said it denounced any and all forms of hatred or violence against Asians or Asian Americans. The United States is taking a stand against what the State Department is calling the genocide of Uyghur Muslims in China. The U.S., European Union, Canada and the United Kingdom jointly announced stiff sanctions against four top Chinese officials for alleged human rights abuses against the ethnic minority. The allies say the abuses included mass imprisonment in detention centers in northwest China and torture. The United Nations says more than one million Uyghurs are dead or missing in what has been compared to the Jewish Holocaust. In response to this week's san sanctions, the Chinese government called the charges lies and disinformation. The U.S. Supreme Court has agreed to hear a government appeal to reinstate the death penalty against Boston Marathon bomber Joe Kart Tsarnaev. The now 27-year-old was convicted of dozens of crimes in the terror attack that killed three people in 2013. He received the death penalty in 2015. The U.S. Court of Appeals threw out the death sentence last year, finding errors during his trial tainted his sentencing. The Trump administration had asked the Supreme Court late last year to take up the case, citing the devastation of the Boston bombing. A reversal could put President Biden in a difficult position because he's promised to push for elimination of the federal death penalty. Coronavirus concerns have prompted a curfew extension on Miami Beach. As spring breakers have flocked to Florida, maskless, out-of-control crowds have overwhelmed Miami Beach, forcing police there to implement an emergency order. Partying shoulder to shoulder, thousands of people have swarmed the streets. These people that are not following the instructions are hurting you. If they get infected, they are going to create variants that are going to spread. Police say they will extend the 8 p.m. weekend curfew through the end of spring break in mid-April. As more people get vaccinated against COVID, air travel is skyrocketing. The TSA reports the number of people passing through U.S. airports hit a pandemic record high this past week. But public health experts fear a surge in the spread of dangerous COVID variants. 
A new study on the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines indicates they provide protection for those who are pregnant or breastfeeding and can pass antibodies to their newborns. The study indicates side effects in those who are pregnant are no more intense than in the general population. And this promising news from the White House. President Biden has announced a new goal of 200 million COVID vaccination shots within his first 100 days in office. As of Friday, 100 million coronavirus vaccinations had been given since he took office. If the vaccination rate is maintained, the 200 million dose target could be hit at the end of April. Economic fallout from the pandemic has hit women and their families especially hard. Millions have lost their jobs in service and other industries dominated by females. Other women have dropped out of the workforce to care for children forced into distance learning at home. The sheer number of women impacted has raised questions about flexibility in the workplace for parents and the need for parental leave policies. Kate Scanlon has our report. I asked the hiring manager, please come up with a different solution because I can't take this job unless you do. For D.C. area attorney Lucy Kelly Hale, the beginning of her career coincided with welcoming her first child. Negotiating a job offer while pregnant, Hale said she knew that just months into her new job she would become a mother. But she was initially told she would not be eligible for even unpaid parental leave because she would not have been in her new role for a full year. She would only be able to use vacation and sick time. A mere two weeks. I just knew it's what we needed to do and I needed to push back and say no this is not going to be an answer for our family. Hale's employer found a workaround by placing her on unpaid administrative leave, giving her more time at home while preserving her job security. But for many women, that option doesn't exist. According to data from the Pew Research Center, the United States is the only developed country without a national paid parental leave policy. The Family and Medical Leave Act provides eligible employees with unpaid job protective leave for specific family and medical reasons, including the birth or adoption of a child. But some advocates say that American families should be entitled to paid parental leave. And one of the reasons paid leave is a priority for us is it really touches all of the different aspects of Catholic Charities. Reagan Vaughn is Director of Advocacy at Catholic Charities of Baltimore, which has lobbied for a state-level paid leave bill in Maryland. Vaughn said in the absence of a national bill, a state bill could keep some families out of poverty. It can put the whole family in a spiral, and we have had families in our shelters who it was a few weeks amidst work that led to the eviction and eventually homelessness. Others, like Carrie Lucas, president of the Conservative Independent Women's Forum, and Maria Sofia Aguiare, a professor of economics at the Catholic University of America, argued that a national policy mandating paid parental leave might sacrifice flexibility for a one-size-fits-all approach. A poorly created uh, government program can leave a lot of people worse off and can create more problems than it solves. But it's a real cost. I'm running a small business. When somebody goes away for six weeks, um, that means that there is a cost, an actual you know, job that needs to be done. We need flexibility because not everybody has the same needs. But the issue goes beyond only women. A 2019 report from the Men Care Global Fatherhood Campaign found that a majority of women in seven countries want men to take paternity leave, saying it would improve their own physical and mental health. The onus of domestic life is often just put on the mother, uh, which we've definitely seen during COVID, which is why more women are leaving the workforce. Destiny Herndon De La Rosa is founder of the pro-life organization New Wave Feminists. She says paid leave is a pro-life issue. It's quite honestly a reason that women choose to terminate because they realize they're having to choose between their career and parenthood. And if they can't um, successfully do both, then a lot of times it will lead to an abortion decision. And so this is absolutely something pro-life groups need to be on the front line talking about. Hale says creative policies are needed to prevent other women and families from relying on solutions that aren't a guarantee. You're going to get better work out of people if you treat them well and treat them with respect and provide opportunities for their families to flourish. Kate Scanlon, EWTN News, In-Depth.
After the break, our roundtable joins us to take a deeper dive into the paid leave issue from a Catholic perspective. But before we wrap up this week in review, a shout out to a special person. 101-year-old Sister Jean Dolores Schmidt proved the good luck charm once again for her beloved Loyola Chicago basketball team after a pregame inspirational speech and prayers from their now famous team chaplain, the Loyola Ramblers staged a stunning upset over number one seed rival Illinois last weekend to advance to the Sweet 16 round of the NCAA tournament. The head coach says Sister Jean's spirit is integral to the team's success. She will lead the team in prayers this weekend as the Ramblers face Oregon State. Our roundtable discussion is next, plus another amazing sister is on our minds this week. No matter where you are or who you are, what you've ever done, only the church can give you hope, can give you love, forgiveness from God himself. Mother Angelica continues to inspire with her words of wisdom. That inspiration lives on on college campuses today. We'll explain ahead. Welcome back. We continue our coverage on the topic of paid leave with some dynamic voices on the subject. Joining me now are Lee Fitzpatrick Sneed, a fellow at the Catholic Association from Granger, Indiana, Veronique Derugi, an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute here in Washington, D.C., and EWTN's executive editor and D.C. bureau chief, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, joins us here in Washington, D.C. Thank you all for taking part in this discussion. Veronique, last year you noted that leave proposals would have Americans paying $10 for a $4 cup of coffee. What is the economic impact of some of the paid leave proposals or the current paid leave proposal now? So, I mean, we tend to often focus on the increase in the payroll tax that employees will see. But I think one of the, and, and it's a very valid point indeed, I mean, very often the proposals are unrealistic about the actual cost to employees. Um, because they tend to underestimate the amount of leave that is going to be to be uh, paid. But that's one important aspect, but it's not the only aspect that uh, that that paid leave at the federal level would trigger. And in my opinion, these other aspects are much more problematic because they are actually not visible. And some of them is that actually in countries that have adopted generous paid leave proposals, we see um, like the beneficiaries actually suffering from fewer hours of employment, lower uh, growth in wages over time, and all sorts of things. And these things are not as visible, and yet they matter tremendously. Lee, the U.S. is an outlier among developed nations not providing leave for new parents, paid leave for new parents. But at least 17 or so states have passed some form of leave. How is leave different and critical for adoptive parents like you? Um, that's an important question, Monty, and it's mostly the unpredictability of adoption and foster care. Um, as everyone knows, but you know, children and babies uh, in any kind of family don't uh, so much respect parents' work schedules. They come when they come. But with um, foster care, there are often emergency placements that could happen in the middle of the night. Um, with adoption, you could have to travel several states away and then you might have to stay in those states if you're if the child had some maybe in utero exposure um, to drugs or if there is some other problem for instance my son was born with a heart defect and had to have emergency surgery while we were in pennsylvania living in a different state um, so all these things come up and it's the unpredictability uh, I, it would be very unsettling especially with people um, if they don't know that they're going to have um, reliable income matthew why, with lower birth rates and corona baby bust, is this a necessary pro-family and pro-life conversation? Well, as Veronique uh, has stressed, uh, any sort of a proposal that's being put forward has to be examined very carefully, uh, whether it's a prudent one, whether it's effective, and whether it's actually going to strengthen families. There are a number of uh, pro-life arguments that have been raised in favor of uh, family leave and, and this type of a program. Uh, we can look, for example, at the way it in potentially incentivizes uh, having children, uh, potentially builds a workplace that encourages family life, a culture of life. And we can add, too, that 
that uh, it also can stress or help develop uh, care for generational uh, members of the family. So in other words, it can strengthen family life uh, generationally, which is something, of course, that Pope Francis has stressed. But again, we have to be focused on the prudence of these uh, proposals and whether or not they're actually going to uh, help families uh, through the creation of more children and, and strengthening family life or whether they're going to create economic problems for them in the long term. On Pope Francis, he recently tweeted about the primacy of the family and his call to the familial experience in Amoris Laetitia. How is this debate significant for Catholics? Well, it's very significant for Catholics because, as Pope Francis is stressing uh, and has throughout his pontificate, that uh, looking at the generations, uh, that a family has to be generational. We have to learn from each generation, and each generation has something to contribute to the other. The Catholic uh, side of this is also bringing into uh, stark focus the importance of family life, the culture of life, as well as, again, making those prudent decisions uh, in public policy. Are policies actually going to improve the dignity of the worker? Are they going to promote uh, the common good? Veronique, back to your earlier comment. More than 2 million U.S. women have left the workforce during the COVID-19 pandemic, in part because of a lack of child care and demands of homeschooling. Would paid leave initiatives hurt or help women advance and integrate into the workforce? So I think we're having this conversation in a vacuum because we are having a lot of misconception. At first, I want to say I'm a big supporter of paid leave. The, 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 the value of paid leave for parents, for adoptive parents, for children, I mean, it's unquestionable. The question at stake here is whether it is the role of the federal government or if the federal government provided such a benefit is actually a good idea. And I... Um, first, I'll say it, it's not because they are actually a massive amount of cost that people don't see but will be shouldering. And the other one is also because we assume that we actually don't have a lot of paid leave already provided in the U.S. The BLS provided number, which is 17 percent, but this number is actually not really accurate of what we actually have because the way the BLS asked the question, it asked specifically uh, workers, if they benefit from a program that is totally independent from their other leaves, from disability insurance, from all sorts of other arrangements that they may have with their employers. And actually, in the U.S., we have already a very extensive and flexible uh, private provision of paid leave, which is quite remarkable and unique, I should say, for industrialized nations. And, and unfortunately, it is true that you know, some lower income Americans don't have uh, paid leave uh, for the most part, uh, usually because they are you know, hourly workers and temporary work. And but but what we know from the data is that actually government programs doesn't improve uh, their situation. Also, we know that government programs do not actually increase fertility, which I mean, if it is one of the reasons to actually put such a program in place, um, is actually it's not going to work. What would be a good solution for these lower income um, for non-federal programs? What would you suggest? So it, it is really hard actually to get to those workers. And we've seen them with a lot of programs like Norway, extremely generous, 100% benefits. But even California, if you want to look at home, but, but these are less generous programs. This is why I think it's kind of important to look at also what the Europeans have done, where they cover the entire salary, is that these uh, programs, even when they're very generous, they're having a very, they're, they're providing a lot for the people who precisely already have paid leave right now. And so they Basically, what it does is that it shifts the burden from the private sector to the government. But it's very hard to tap to those workers. Like, things that we could be doing is um, is creating the most, um, the more ways for people to save in a tax-free environment for whatever they want. So have, like, a way for these workers to actually first turn over time into future paid leave, which right now they can't do uh, without, I mean, they just simply can't do. Right. Or, um, right. or have, you know, savings accounts that are very flexible, that are not just, the, you know, for allocation towards your retirement or education, or it's just for whatever it is you need. But right. it is hard. It's hard. It is hard. Lee, for at-risk families, it's hard as well. With more than 350 
2,000 foster children in the U.S. and counting with the COVID-19 pandemic, which has raised this number of at-risk children to a number of child welfare authorities who fear that they will never be able to account for the surging rates of unreported abuse and neglect. How does paid leave factor into this decision to foster and adopt? Um, I think, again, with the unpredictability, uh, to know that you would be able to, at the drop of a hat, uh, while maintaining even a partial salary, um, would make you more likely to open your home to a foster child. Um, there's different things to consider. You have to integrate um, a new member, uh, new child into maybe you have existing children. Um, also, best practices would dictate that uh, because a lot of children who have been through the foster care system have experienced some kind of trauma, they really need the security of being with their primary caregiver. And the sort of general rule of thumb is one for one month for every year they weren't living in your home. And I think I think paid family leave could go a lot way. I mean, of course, that's not always going to work for every family, but um, ideally it would. Lee, last question for you. Do you have a message for um, families who haven't fostered or adopted? Um, I think that everyone uh, can participate in it, whether it's making sure that, uh, you know, the people who are fostering uh, children also, you know, get the new mommy meals and um, that adoptive moms get baby showers and that, uh, you know, we, you know, just like anything, we use polite language and realize that, you know, adopted children are your children, not, you know, there's not different, they're not, not your real children or, and, you know, that kind of language, I think, um, stigmatizes it. And also it stigmatizes it on the behalf of um, women uh, looking to maybe place their babies for adoption. Thank you so much, Lee, Veronique, and Dr. Bunsen for this very important discussion. And for more from EWTN News In Depth, we invite you to connect with us on our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages. Next, we look back and we look forward. We'll tell you how Mother Angelica lives on in these young campus missionaries as they follow in her footsteps. It's a week of reflection for staff here at EWTN as we remember our foundress, Mother Angelica, who died five years ago this weekend. Without her doing the Lord's work, there would be no EWTN. Her faith helped dig the foundation for what is now a global Catholic network. What started as just four hours of broadcasting a day in 1981, reaching just 60,000 people, is now the largest religious network in the world, reaching 230 million viewers in more than 140 countries. Her work expanded beyond broadcast. It was in 1987 that she began the men's religious community. She saw the need for there to be a spiritual support for the network. Thanks be to God, we have 10 priests and three permanent brothers, and we're doing just what Mother had envisioned. The Franciscan missionaries of the Eternal Word help communicate through broadcast media the truth and beauty of the Catholic faith through word and example. They're an incredible resource for EWTN employees seeking spiritual guidance. Mother Angelica leaves a legacy that continues to grow. Her yes to Christ in taking her vows and her yes to Christ in her never wavering faith in establishing this network are a gift to us all. It has provided a path to our Lord Jesus Christ for viewers around the world. Mother Angelica was also instrumental in the launch of mission work on college and university campuses. An organization called FOCUS, or the Fellowship of Catholic University Students, gained national attention when its founders, Curtis Martin and Scott Hahn, appeared on Mother's show. She asked viewers to reach into their couches and use their spare change to take FOCUS off the ground. Founder Curtis Martin told EWTN, it would be true to say that Mother Angelica was a midwife for Focus. Before we ever placed a missionary on a campus, Mother invited Scott Hahn and me to be a guest on her show. He went on to say, we raised several thousand dollars from that show, and that became seed money for the start of our work with young people. Focus now has more than 35,000 alumni and has fostered more than 950 vocations. Spreading the faith and reaching more souls was always Mother Angelica's main mission. We take a look now at how some missionaries for Focus are impacting young souls today. Doing the work of the disciples. I think wherever the Lord is calling us and in terms of the leadership, um, we're going to be there. Work we're all called to do as Christians. Helping people see their identity as sons and daughters 
um, of a God that loves them. Something Mother Angelica knew very well. Everybody needs to know they are never alone, that God loved them before time began. As she read scripture, she explained her love for God and God's love for all of us. Could reach out and touch them and say, the Father loves you and he's prepared a kingdom for you. She set an example for us on how to share the faith. Her story is really a powerful witness to like what God can do um, when we cooperate with him and let him work through us. Especially for young women in the church. Her impact and her influence of, if this religious sister could do something beautiful like this um, and reach so many souls and so many people, I can too. Today, five young missionaries at George Washington University are spreading the good news. This faith is meant to be for every single person in the world. They know what is at stake. The reality is there are a lot of souls that are from the, far from the church. The salvation of souls. It's been, I think about the C.S. Lewis quote that talks about how every person we meet um, is an immortal soul and they'll either spend it um, with God or without God. Like the first followers of Jesus, they too face rejection. It's, it's tough. It's, uh, it's not easy doing it. They face a lot of challenges. Being a missionary during a pandemic on a college campus is an everyday struggle. The impact of lockdowns from COVID-19 has forced what would normally be one-on-one -on -one discipleship to go virtual. We have online Bible studies where we schedule weekly um, times to um, pray through scripture, discuss whatever struggles that we have. And making sure everyone they mentor during the pandemic feel seen, known, and cared for. When a lot of my guys were virtual that I, was, that I was working directly in contact with was just, I can't be there for you in the same way, but I can pray for you and I can fast for you. Growing secularism is also a challenge. It's kind of crazy to be Catholic on campus nowadays, um, especially at a pretty secular university. This work, they say, is vital to the future of the church. We want to help you right now learn how to leave college and go into a parish and start Bible studies there and evangelize people there and then bring other people into that parish as well. So when it comes to reaching the youth, it's really helping them to be formed to set them up for the rest of their life. Just like Mother Angelica knew that Jesus would provide a path for opening hearts, they too know that the Holy Spirit is leading the way. It takes a lot of work. Usually what happens is like God does, does most of it. One of the biggest blessings um, that we have is just Christ being the model. They're grateful to share his love and transform the world through Christ. I hope that everyone can know that they are loved, not just by another person, but by the creator that made them and adores them. Secretly is one of the best jobs out there because it's, it's all about helping people find God and that's what everyone wants ultimately. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Each of these missionaries come from different parts of the country, different walks of life, but they all realize that we are one universal church. We should all be on mission with them. As we close, we remember not just the anniversary of Mother Angelica's passing, but another anniversary. Eight years ago this month, Jorge Bergoglio was elected the first Jesuit Pope and the first from the Americas. He chose the papal name Francis. To commemorate his anniversary, we take you to the Cathedral of St. Francis in Assisi, Italy. Beautiful pictures from our Vatican Bureau in our images of the week. Enjoy and see you again next week.